Hello everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and we're back with another Total War Warhammer video. We've got some new information regarding Grand Cafe and this time it comes in the form of a developer Q&A, a very small one by Andy Hall. He is the lead writer for Warhammer 3 and a former employee for Games Workshop, so he's been in the Warhammer Fantasy universe for quite some time. So let's just jump right in and see what he has to say about Grand Cafe. Cafe. Let's start off with TotalWar.com. Thanks for joining us, Andy. Since we haven't spoken about Grand Cafe before, can you give us a short intro on who they are, what's special about them, and the work you did to bring them to life? Andy responds, When talking with my ex-colleagues at Games Workshop, we wanted Cafe to feel that it was just as rich and iterated upon as any Warhammer race, even if the players hadn't been able to see this until now. The goal was to make them feel like a fully-fledged 8th edition race right out the gate, with their own roster, quirks, and spectacle. The team at Games Workshop tapped into the design ethos of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, which has been to take archetypes, both historical and mythic then twist and push them to extremes. This has given us a deep roster to play with, with plenty of potential areas for expansion. But from a purely player perspective, whether it's on Total War or on the tabletop, I think the real innovation is the dragons, that they can transform into both draconic and human aspects, and each form gives players myriad tactical options in battle. That is exciting. Okay, so let's talk about this specific section. First up, they turned it into a fully-fledged 8th edition race, or that's what they wanted to do in terms of feel, which is absolutely awesome. As a competitive tabletop player myself, it would be really cool if they could show off the rules themselves and possibly have some tabletop players be able to play them on the tabletop just to kind of show off what they'd be like. Think of it in a purely translation method, how, say for example, a lot of people have been able to look at some battle reports of the Orcs and Goblins, Skaven and so on, and see how they differ from the tabletop to Total War. It would be kind of cool just to see that perspective. It's great that they've kept with the same design philosophy of both historical and mythic to create a Warhammer Fantasy race, as that has actually been embedded into the Warhammer Fantasy style since the 80s, so this is really important. In all honesty, they feel more Warhammer Fantasy than, say for example, Kislev at the moment, as Kislev does look like a lot of hybrid stuff, and hybrid stuff wasn't really that common. They do mention that there's plenty of areas for expansion, and yeah, we know there's DLC. I mean, they've already started hinting at the Monkey King and that was kind of expected. I'm really curious what they mean here about the whole dragon changing into human aspect and so on. This is going to be quite versatile for obviously Total War. I can't wait to see how that works because it's going to be really interesting to see a humanoid turn into a dragon. The humanoid lords are already quite powerful as it is so it's going to be really cool to see how exactly the power shifting works and how many times we can transform and so on. It's really really curious. Tabletop wise if we're looking at it in an 8th edition standing point, not a good idea unless they've got something to increase their ward save. I mean, we have to wait and see how it works for Old World, but monsters for 8th edition were not that great. Maybe Games Workshop should show the rules so we could see. Yeah? Nah, I know, I know. I'm just trying to hint there. Sometimes they do watch the videos, I'm assuming, so it would be nice. Okay, let's move on to the next section. On to Miao Ying, the Storm Dragon. Who is she? She is the eldest daughter of the Celestial Dragon Emperor and holds many titles. Master of the Storm Winds, Castellan of the Great Bastion, Ruler of the Northern Provinces, Matriarch of Nangao. God, she's trying to be like Cetra, isn't she? She is as powerful as those honors suggest, and everything you expect and more from a Warhammer Legendary Lord. As a cool tactician and powerful magic user, as any High Elf, but able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a greater demon in dragon form. But what I find really engaging, and she is my favorite legendary lord by the way, is her personality. See, this is what I mean, they talk about dragons being really powerful as magic users and as dragon form, so does this mean that they'll be able to cast well in dragon form? Which is possible in the tabletop, they're in fact dragons which could be very potent spellcasters. 
It just kind of sounds like the Cafe and Legendary Lords are going to be on this really high power level. And what we've seen from the army so far, it doesn't look like Cafe is going to be weak whatsoever. And they might just be some of the top tier factions. The Legendary Lord, however, is really cool. I like her aesthetic. I really, really like the dragon form too. So we're going to have to wait and see how the transformation thing works. But everything so far, she looks awesome. Let's move on to the next section. What makes her character so compelling? As a writer, you look for ways to connect and emphasize with your characters. It's not always easy to do when they're Warhammer villains such as Cetra or Archeon, but even then, we must understand their drives. Well, first off, let me just jump right in. Cetra's not a villain. He is neutral in alignment, and yeah, he did try to take over the world and so on, but it was nothing with a whole end the world or evil thing. It was just him being a warmonger. I wouldn't call him a villain. I mean, there was nothing to really suggest that he was ever a villain, but let's move on. Powerful, aloof, celestial dragon beings could easily fall into the same category. But the familial angle gives us a way in. She is the eldest daughter trying to prove her worth to her father against jealous siblings. That's a very human scenario, and one we can leverage and understand, especially for me as a father with a very determined older daughter. Again, Cetra, not a villain, just trying to emphasize that. Other than that, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. They're trying to humanize the characters, which does make sense. They did do this in a lot of Black Library novels, like, for example, Wolfric's book humanizes Chaos Warriors into a certain degree. So the fact that they're trying to do this with Cafe, which is a new faction, that's great. That's honestly really, really good. It keeps with the whole theme of how they were trying to move along the Warhammer universe. Let's move on. One of the titles you gave about stands out. Matriarch of Nangao. Can you elaborate? Yes, she rules the City of Smoke, although the Lords of Nangao are perhaps not as deferent to a dragon as the ruling classes in other cities. This is because the city is home to countless forges and workshops that furnish the armies of the Empire with weapons and provide countless war machines for the defense of the Great Bastion. So, the Lords are powerful, granted more independence than most, and have occasionally even dared to challenge the Storm Dragon. Although, she has swiftly reminded them of their true station. Okay, so maybe Nanga will act as a sort of city-state in a sense? Or there'll be loads of different events in her campaign specifically regarding the Lords trying to be more independent, maybe them sabotaging you or something. I don't know, it sounds really interesting. I like the idea of them being a city-state and you'll have to like do some quests to be able to get stuff from them, but more than likely it'll be something else. Who knows? I am honestly really curious as this does sound very city-state-like. Hopefully it won't be too long until we start getting some campaign information for Cafe because, well, actually, have we gotten any information for Kislev yet in campaign? No, no, we haven't. Okay. Let's move on to the next section. How does she compare to her brother in arms and blood? Zhao Ming, our other legendary lord. Her vaulted position as the commander of the Great Bastion means she is, perhaps correctly, perceived as the favorite by the other dragons. The Storm Dragon doesn't help matters by lording her position over her siblings. When they meet, she often stands apart. Zhao Ming, her younger brother, is a far more gregarious character and gets especially offended by Ying's aloofness. So we're not learning here too much about Zhao Ming, but it is confirmed that we will have some information next week, so that's kind of cool. Now, when it comes to Miao Ying, we're pretty much learning that she's a bit of a stuck-up snob. And not many people do like that. It's the whole favoritism thing. Many of you guys probably have siblings and so on, so you can kind of guess how this works. It's going to be interesting to see how that plays. It would be interesting if we had some sort of cafe and civil war or something. I don't know, because then again, if they end up fighting, would that mean that the Celestial Dragon Emperor would take part to basically keep his kids in check or something? It is honestly quite curious, but hey, I guess this is just to bring her more into the front of things so people can get to know her much more. So we, we've only really seen her in trailers at the moment and a little bit of info here and there. So it's nice to have a dedicated blog. Now, next week, we're going to be able to find out more about Zhao Ming. And in all honesty, I'm more interested in the Eastern Dragon because he looks kind of cool. And well, yeah, no, cool factor always kind of works here. They also mention a 
rather curious thing of they'll be able to give you an overview of who's available to align with the Eastern Empire. Don't get me wrong, I do like the Storm Dragon, but the Iron Dragon just has no information at the moment and a lot of people are curious, including myself, so it's just how it works. But so far we've learned quite a bit about this character, so I'm quite happy about that. Context when it comes to Warhammer Fantasy is really important, and it was always kind of difficult to show off in Warhammer Total War, considering of course that obviously this isn't really a narrative game. But what do you guys think about the Storm Dragon? Are you interested in her, or are you getting kind of sick of her? Because, well, she has been in the spotlight for a while, so it's kind of understandable. But let me know your thoughts in comments below, and let's start a bit of a discussion. But with that, my friends, we've come to the end of our video. Thank you so much for watching. If you did enjoy the video, might I suggest giving the video a like, or even subscribing to the channel as it really does help us out. In the description section below are various links to different social media platforms such as Facebook, Instagram and Discord. Also in the description section is an affiliate link with Element Games where you could buy loads of hobby based products, not just Warhammer, for 10-25% to off. Making a purchase using that link and also our special code which is also in the description supports the channel at no extra cost to you, which we think is rather cool. A big thank you to our patrons, your support means the world to us, it's amazing that people want to help a small channel like us grow and get to our higher level of content. A big thank you to Gibraltar LUSC, Ryan Birch, Andrew Prince and Okro for subscribing to us at our fame level, you guys are super cool. And a big thank you to Edward Yule, VS Fasan, Aaron Whitman and Shaggy for subscribing to us at our king level, honestly we can't thank you all enough. And lastly, a big thank you to all of you for liking, sharing and commenting on these videos. Honestly, it's because of you guys that the channel has been growing at such a great pace lately, so we can't thank you all enough. But with that my friends, thank you so much for watching once again, and we shall see you all again very very soon. Have a good day.